Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddy Sayers. I'm here in Vienna, the capital of Austria. You can see the Rathaus, the parliament building just behind me. And it's an apparently ordinary, quite gloomy November morning. Except it's not actually an ordinary morning because at midnight last night, a new law came into place which said that anyone who is not vaccinated is not legally allowed to leave their home except for certain prescribed reasons. In other words, it is the world's first lockdown for the unvaccinated. I wanted to come here to find out what does a society feel like where a third of the population has been kept at home in mandatory house arrest? What do the people who are walking around feel about that new reality? And perhaps most importantly, what does it feel like for those people stuck at home? I think it comes much too late. And I think, I think it's very unfair of people who are not for health reasons not taking a vaccine because that's obvious, you know. But all the others, they're crazy. And all the trouble we have is due to those people who believe in, I don't know, the earth is flat. <laughs> so how long would you be happy for them to be stuck at home for? Uh, I don't think that will help, that's the thing. But what, is, what makes me hopeful is that now some of those people who refuse to have a vaccine are now thinking of having second thoughts because they have no access to restaurants, they have no access to theater or anything. And I know people like that do now all of a sudden, they're in a hurry to get a vaccine. So you're not worried that a whole little part of society is just invisible now, stuck at home? If the, if the majority of society depends on idiots, then we can't be helped, and that's the end of society. No, no, I don't think. We had it for everybody some time ago, so I think it's now for a special group and they should do it. No, I think it's, I think it's the right way because, uh, because um, uh, the, the um, cases are getting higher and higher and higher and the problems are the non-vaccinated people, so I'm fine with that. Isn't it true that you can still transmit if you're vaccinated? I, what, what do you mean? You can still pass the corona on. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think everybody should do what we can do yeah. and to be vaccinated it's the very best option we have. So everybody should do that. You're not worried? No. I'm not solidarity with these people and I believe that uh, it's a good decision from the government. So you don't feel sorry for them stuck at home? No, why I should be punished for the people who just not uh, uh, have uh, uh, the intention to be uh, uh, vaccinated and uh, integrated in our community. Do you know anyone who's not vaccinated? Yes, yesterday, unfortunately, I met a, a child. He's not going to school today because of lockdown. And um, I asked him why. I said, because I'm not uh, vaccinated. I said, why? I'm scared about that. It's... You think no. that's silly? No, I don't accept that. And it's, fine. it's not uh, the parents should uh, encourage kids to, to get vaccinated. You don't have to talk to very many people here in this smart, well-heeled shopping part of old Vienna to get a very clear impression. There is no sympathy for the unvaccinated. There is very strong support for this measure. When you approach people who look maybe like they're making deliveries or passing through rather than shopping at Rolex, you get a slightly different response. It's a bullshit. Yeah? Really? Yes. What, why? Why? The people, they, they must be free. This is, this is not okay. And do you, have you been vaccinated? Yes, I have been vaccinated, yes. Do you know lots of people who have not? Yes, I know. But the people is for himself. Yeah, yeah, they, always people yeah, they can do what they want. I don't think it's good. Yeah, it's trouble. Why is that? Because economically will be down. Everything will be not nice. We have taken refuge from the cold in one of Vienna's many cafes and I suppose the impression I have so far is of the boiled frog syndrome in action. 
where because of the strangeness of the past couple of years, the norms have changed so gradually that no one here really thinks that much about the idea of locking up a third of your population in their homes. If the practical effect of it was driving it, that would be one thing. The sense that it could really change the pandemic. If, for example, vaccinated people were not transmitting and only the unvaccinated were the cause of any transmission, that might be a bit more understandable. But you don't find that people are talking about that. And when I raise the fact that vaccinated people can also transmit the disease, people aren't especially interested. And I suppose it feels like it's become more of a class issue. There is a part of society that the rest of society just doesn't like very much. And to watch that in action, to see people's hardening attitude to them as they, instead of thinking this is something sad and reluctant that they have to do but it's necessary, almost quite relish the chance to, to punish or to draw a line under these people whose behavior is unacceptable. That's quite difficult to watch. We wanted to get a sense of the political situation, so headed over to talk to Ivan Krastev, a political scientist at Vienna's Institute for Human Sciences. What's interesting from an outsider is that the very concept of confining a minority of the population to their homes as an indefinite step seems shocking. It's something that I think it would be very hard to get past in the United Kingdom, for example. How is it that here, and we've been talking to people all morning who don't seem at all phased by this, they think it's high time, they're uninterested by it, and they have very little patience with the unvaccinated. How did it happen that this step was taken with so little fanfare? I do believe that here the basic problem is when uh, some of the anti-vaccine people said, we are ready basically to defend our freedoms. The message of the government was, okay, let's see how much price you're ready to pay for this. Uh, because uh, in a certain way, the major idea of this measure is to make these people uncomfortable. They said, okay, you don't want uh, to basically follow. We see you as a kind of a threat to others. And don't forget, in the opinion polls, when you ask people whom you see as the major threat, this is the irresponsible behavior of others. Uh, and I do believe, of course, if you're going to put these people to stay home, it's not going to solve many of your problems. But this is this type of a nudging philosophy that you're making the cost of not vaccination much higher. In a certain way, you are going to feel very much uncomfortable. Not to do it well, you it can't leave your house. So exactly, that's pretty it makes, exactly. No, no, exactly. Yeah. It makes it very, it changes your everyday life. It, so this is a kind of a subversion of the obligatory vaccination. I mean, the idea of nudge, though, is not to make things illegal or, or mandatory, but just make the kind of so-called choice architecture different. But p confining people to their homes is, is as uh, bad no, as no, draconian. No, no, I agree, but the, basically, instead of got in, going with the mandatory uh, vaccination, which basically you have in certain areas in the United States and others, this is why I said that this is the soft version of the mandatory obligation. Uh, but you're right on something different. On psychological level, it can be perceived as more offensive because, uh, and we have been on mandatory uh, vaccination, the government takes the responsibility on itself. So now, in a certain way, you're shifting the responsibility to the non-vaccinated. And isn't it likely that it will just increase the distrust, increase the paranoia, and therefore create a more divided society here in Austria? No, no, listen, for sure, the vaccinated and vaccinated divide is extremely important and it's going to be very deep because uh, you see others who are making a choice different than uh, yours as a threat to you and society. A and this, this is a very much a dividing line and the problem is how you're dealing with them. Uh, here also you have an interesting situation, for example, around 60% are vaccinated and the government either risks to work weak in the eyes of these 60 people who said, OK, we vaccinated and what you're doing about others. Why are you not protecting us from those people who don't do it? So it's much more easy to press on the minority because you have the feeling that you have the legitimacy speaking on this majority group. And also don't forget that in Austria there was a political crisis recently, basically. Uh, the prime minister, the chancellor had to step down. And as a result of it, for the government, it's very important to demonstrate level of decisiveness. Let me ask a final question, which is a sensitive one, because there's a 
very good rule, which is don't mention the war. And I generally think that's the one to follow. But as this news came out of Austria, a lot of people were making the connection that it's not the first time in their history that a minority that was considered you know, unclean and unsavory was confined and much worse. Do you think that is an inappropriate thought to have, in which case, why is that? I don't believe that this is kind of the trust classical Austrian authoritarianism in life. I do believe this is the part of the West European societies in which so much security is taken for granted. So much basically you have a risk averse culture that the moment when the crisis comes, uh, the government basically starts to fight even the low risk in the way you're going basically to fight uh, uh, apocalyptic scenarios. This is what in my view is changing. But I don't believe that you're not going to say they're doing this because in 1938 they did this, this and that. Uh, and secondly, there is a major difference to be also. The problem is the minorities that you pressed in 1938 was the minorities that you don't allow to become majorities. Here, in a certain way, the dream of the government is that as a result of these policies, everybody got vaccinated. Uh, so from this point of view, the analogy uh, is not the one that works. So we wanted to get out of town and talk to some people who were not being vaccinated and find out what their experience was. We're about to meet a couple who are both trapeze artists. They're circus performers and actors and neither of them have chosen to be vaccinated and because of that they are currently in lockdown. I think this is it. Guten Tag. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Is Mia home too? Yeah. Oh yeah. great. Hi. Hello. Freddy. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Welcome. Thank you so much. So I am here with Mia and Chris, um, who have kindly asked us in for a cup of tea. Um, they are both acrobats and performers. Chris, you're also a fire eater. Mm, sometimes. And, and more. <laughs> and more. Um, and you have chosen not to be vaccinated. So you're caught up in this whole story. I guess the first question has to be why? Why, why not take the vaccine? My choice was, in, on first hand, that it's mine. I really can't understand why I should want or why I have to give the responsibility for my health in the hands of the government. Mm -hmm. This made no sense for me and especially no sense for the, according to the situation. And Mia, you felt the same? Sure, yeah, uh, but for me, I think like my two main reasons are in the first place because um, I, I do believe in science mm -hmm. at some level, of course, and um, I think the, the way things are being handling, they are not very much um, fitting to the scientific method I think science, science is a lot about debate and then since the, the whole crisis began everybody who spoke against uh, the government narrative was just uh, punished somehow mm. and I think this is it's a sign for me that uh, science has not been uh, done openly and I think science can just be done openly you need to hear, to hear all the many voices from the scientific community. Did you feel that the, the vaccine, when it arrived, you just didn't trust it? Or were you frightened of it? Did you think it was potentially dangerous? Or what was your... How did that fit in when it happened? The first thing was like a, a kind of a sense of strangeness. For me it was very strange that um, from the very beginning, the vaccine was appointed as the only solution. Like, we will be free when there will be a vaccine. Like, they could not even know it. Like, if you were really making serious science, they would try to find solution in different areas. And there is not a rule who says, uh, you just find a solution for a virus through a vaccine. I think they should have opened the 
a spectrum of opportunities and research in many different areas and that was not the case at all like from the very beginning it was there will be peace again when there will be a vaccine and i think this was already my red my first red flag mm -hmm. because how they can possibly know <laughs> and then yeah. when it came out it was second big red flag because i i personally i don't really trust the big pharma industry i think they are very uh, profit oriented i see them as a business and as a business i i don't think they are in the first instance uh, worried about the health of people um, mm. honestly mia you've actually had covid yeah. And, and recovered and in the 2G system that is now here in Austria that means that you are allowed to walk around and you can go into public places and fairs and restaurants but Chris you haven't had it or you don't know if you've had it so therefore you are now in lockdown is that right yeah yeah so what, what is your life going to be like now yeah see right now it's still the same <laughs> Right now it's still the same. For me personally, I would say the whole thing for me was mainly 80% brain fuck until now. Everything, it was okay. It was, it was more, more mentally. And now to my lifestyle, it's not so much difference. We work as artists. We are often at home. We, we're not these party peoples. I, I'm not so much. And uh, with friends, we can meet at home. I mean, now this is also a little bit, I don't know how many persons it's allowed. I don't know. But so my, my lifestyle never changed so much. But does it make you feel different that you're now not legally allowed to leave your house? Except for, you know, five reasons. It's a brain fuck. Mm. No, no. I, I work on it that I'm not. <laughs> I, I don't want to be responsible on, uh, not responsible, I, want, I don't want to be dependent on this kind of uh, um, things to make me happy. That was great to meet Mia and Chris, lovely people, kindly letting us into their home. And so, okay, they have reached their beliefs in their own way. Maybe a lot of people don't agree with them, but the idea that they are now outcast from society and are supposed to be these reprobates that need to be banished seems very, very strange and worrying. So what is the legal basis? How is this even constitutional? One of Austria's most eminent human rights lawyers, Manfred Novak, agreed to talk to us and we met him in the Great Hall of the Applied Arts University in Vienna. Hi, Hi Professor. very nice to meet you. So you are Secretary General of the Global Campus on Human Rights. You're a professor out of um, Venice, but you're currently based here at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. What's the headline? Is it legitimate and justifiable to take a subsection of the population and commit them to mandatory house arrest in this way? Yes, I think so. But of course you have to understand the precise conditions. And we are now in a situation that our um, capacities in the COVID sections of the hospitals in the intensive care are really getting at their limits. And at the same time, we have a very low vaccination rate and a very substantial number of people who could be vaccinated but who don't want. For whatever reasons, it's a wide spectrum. And I think it is justified to say uh, we need out of solidarity with the others, uh, we need to take stronger action. It might be that we need another lockdown for everybody. But many of the people who are vaccinated are simply now saying, why should we again go into the lockdown only because some of those don't want to be vaccinated. So from a, a, a human rights perspective, you always have to balance. You have to balance on the one hand, the state has an obligation to protect the right to life, the right to health, 
And by that, it interferes with the rights of others. Mm. That might be personal liberty in this case, because you said house arrest. When in reality, we have had that already before. You can go out, for instance, in order to take a walk. You also shouldn't mingle too much with other people. You can do your shopping, you can do your work. So it's not really house arrest in that sense, uh, but it is a lockdown, yes. So it's freedom of movement, it's not really your personal liberty that is, that is taken away. Well, your personal liberty to leave your house, I suppose, is, is one serious personal liberty. But there's something a little unusual about it, which is that the justification you just gave is really that it's a method to increase uptake of the vaccine. So it's this sort of slightly circuitous route where instead of doing the more straightforward thing, which is to mandate it or at least make it a legal principle, there's this attempt to look like you're not mandating it, but you're making life almost unbearable for people who haven't. Does that sit right with you as a method? I would certainly say a mandatory vaccination. So if I bind you on a chair uh, and then actually get you the shot, that's certainly violating your right to human treatment. Uh, it's, uh, many people would say this is almost getting torture. That certainly should not happen, but that's not necessary. You can say, like what we have also, and we had, uh, as I said, with polio or with, uh, or with, with uh, smallpox, etc., that you say you have an obligation, and if you're not fulfilling the obligation, you get a fine. Like uh, if you are violating the traffic code, you also get a fine. You have to pay a certain penalty. And that might help in the long term that people would actually say, OK, I don't want to pay too often, so I let myself be vaccinated. So I would think that a legal obligation with this kind of light punishments in case you are violating, this is an administrative offense, it's not a criminal offense, if you don't do it, would be something that in my opinion would still be proportional and probably the more honest way than doing it indirectly, as you said, by saying, I mean, you are now under lockdown, you, you can't anymore go to any kind of restaurants, etc. Um, so the, the indirect obligation uh, to, to let yourself vaccinate it. I mean, I suppose it's an intuition as well with these things, because I genuinely don't think that in the United Kingdom a government would be successful in implementing this policy where you say that only a small portion of the population suddenly had to stay at home. I don't feel that would be a political possibility because it would be outrageous to too many people. What is it about some of these European countries, do you think, that makes it more possible or, or why are they different? I mean, many people here feel the same, that it is outrageous. Um, the problem is that, and there I have to say it's the political right wing, the extreme right wing parties, that uh, at the beginning <coughs> we had a, a big consensus about in the first lockdown in spring 2020. Uh, but then the right wing party felt that they have to use COVID-19 as a political issue because the main political issue they had, migrants were no longer there, was not really a big issue, so they needed another scapegoat. Uh, and that was now all of a sudden criticizing the government for everything. And the, the new leader, former Minister of Interior of the right-wing party was really very, very, it was almost hate speech uh, in, in really uh, trying to divide society and saying we are against all these kind of measures. We go on demonstrations, we have a healthy immune system, so we are, uh, that is much more important than all those vaccinations and all those restrictions. And that really created a very toxic atmosphere in the society. And now we have to do whatever we can do, again, trying to bridge the divide um, and, 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 uh, and there I agree <coughs> with you that now taking a very strong measure against one third of the population and saying you have to stay home and the others have less restrictions might actually deepen the divide. So we 
Uh, that's why I also said it is a, a first step that they did now. I think it is legally speaking okay. Whether it will work, that it really reduces the weight, I don't know, because it will also be very, very difficult to actually implement. You've been a special rapporteur to the United Nations on torture. You've been investigating Guantanamo Bay. You're still, I believe, involved in a project to do with child liberty. These are areas close to your whole career. But when you see this scenario, which is your own Austrian people, a portion of them being kept at home, you don't get a twinge of anxiety about whether this is a new departure for Western democracy, whether this takes us in a dangerous state of emergency that might carry on for too long. Those things, you're not anxious about those? No, not really, not from a human rights perspective. What I am afraid is that it is a further step in dividing society. Um, and I, I am afraid, and we will have very soon, another big uh, demonstration organized by the FPÖ in Vienna. And I, if you follow on social media, the rhetoric is becoming very, very much us and them, and it becomes very hostile. And you feel that often also in the, uh, in the underground, for instance, if you have uh, people who are not wearing masks and others are saying, but would not be better, you should actually wear a mask, that people are reacting in a very aggressive manner. Um, and I think we have to bridge this divide again. Professor Novak, thank you so much. So as night falls here in Vienna, it almost looks like just another Christmassy scene. The famous Christmas market just in front of the Rathaus is now open for business. The lights are twinkling and customers are filing in. Squint and it almost looks like a perfect Christmas scene. There's only one difference, which is that a third of the population, including Mia, including Chris, are not allowed in. Hi. <laughs> and an ID? ID? Yes. Thank you. I'm in. The almost hilarious thing at the end of all of this is that the moment everyone is past the barrier, the moment you've shown your barcode and you've waved your ID and you've put your mask on, everybody starts to relax. The masks are coming off. I would say 90% of people here are not wearing masks. Everyone is having a nice, normal Christmassy time with their families and they've forgotten all about it. Is there one person in this market who has COVID right now? Probably there is. Would people have been in great danger if that person was actually two or three people? Probably not, because we're outside and people aren't even that closely packed. But the fact of excluding a certain number of people, of adding those checks, evidently makes everybody feel better. And at the end of the day, that is what a lot of this is all about.